So one of the blocks that's very important to us is the oscillator, right? And we have talked a little bit about that in the, uh, before in different places, and we've talked a little bit more today about it. Now, if you remember, there was a discussion about, you know, we talked diff ex extensively about feedback, right? And we, we talked about return ratio, loop gain, things of that sort. But one of the things that, and we saw that if you have a loop gain, if you have a loop gain that's greater than, let's say, the magnitude is greater than one, and its phase, is, the way it's defined is 180 degrees, but really it's 360 because there's a negative minus sign in the definition of loop gain, that was neither a necessary condition nor sufficient condition for oscillation, right? We saw a counterexample earlier. However, if you want to have an oscillator, you do need to have that, you, you, that's one of the starting points of condition, uh, starting conditions for designing an oscillator from a small signal perspective. So, so this is the question that how do you design an oscillator really is a more broad definition, and we'll talk about it when we about, talk about describing functions, we'll see that. But let's start with a circuit analysis, a small signal circuit analysis, that allows us to think about different topologies of oscillators. So, so imagine that you have a device, let's say it could be a bipolar or it could be a MOSFET, doesn't really matter, I'm showing it here as a bipolar, but this analysis applies to the MOSFET. Let's say there is some sort of an output resistance R2, and let's say there's an input resistance R1, and then there's a total resistance here Ri, and a total resistance, well, let's just make it you know, regular color code, um, Ri and Ro, right? Now, a lot of typical standard oscillator topologies can be captured as, in this, as this general configuration. So you can actually think about it as three reactances, right? So we show them as Zs, but really they are, should really show them as Xs because they are purely reactive. So let's call this Z1, Z2, and Z3. Now applying different reactances to different to these three, um, you know, that is like placeholders, if you will, you will get different topologies. You get all of these topo standard topologies, like you know, uh, you know, Armstrong and Colpitts and Clap and all of those things. It's basically just what reactances you apply to these things. So if you analyze something like this in general, it captures a lot of these different oscillator topologies. So how can we analyze this? I mean, if this is a small signal model, we basically can draw a system. You can think about it as a small signal model. You can draw the GM of the transistor, so some GM uh, V1. And then you have the total output resistance equivalent, which is the RO. Then you go to what you see. You see Z1 to ground, or X1, um, Z3 across and Z2 to ground. And Z2 actually is in parallel with whatever Ri is, right? So you also have an Ri here. And this is the voltage that we call V1, right? So let's call this V1, or small signal um, V1. V1. And this is GM V1, this current. So this is basically what you see. So, so this becomes V1, right? That's the voltage. Now, we try to analyze this in generality so we actually get a general guideline for designing of oscillators, right? So one of the things that you're looking at, so, so how do we analyze this? This is a simple circuit analysis, really, because you could think about this as a resistive divider, right, between this current divider, right? So you have whatever current you have between this side, this branch, and this branch is divided here, and this current is fed through here, so it goes through this impedance to produce that voltage. Now, you can do that. You can basically call this IA, and if this is IA, IA. Now, and we are trying to determine some sort of a, let's say, in this case, it would be similar, but let's say you're trying to calculate some sort of a return ratio. So you apply an IZ here, so this is IX and this is IY, right? And so if it's IX, then IA to IX, 
is going to be essentially the resistive divider ratio, right? It's 1 over 1 plus, um, so it would be the sum of the Z3 plus that impedance, Z3 plus Z2 parallel Ri divided by um, this guy, uh, Z1 parallel RO. Now, and then Iy to Ix, which is the ratio of this current that comes back, so Iy to Ix is simply going to be um, Gm V1, V1, which is this current over uh, Iy. And then you, uh, uh, over Ix, sorry, over Ix, because that's what that is. And then you plug in this from that guy, and then it, plug it from this one to that one, and then what you get is that your, your return ratio, which is defined as negative Iy over Ix, is going to be, you can write it, and when you write it and simplify, you can write basically, it becomes Gm Ri parallel Z2 divided by 1 plus Z3 plus Ri, or Z2 parallel Ri divided by Z3, Z1 parallel RO. And if you simplify it, if you take this through this whole thing and simplify it, it reduces to minus sign, minus sign here. So it simplifies to GM RI RO Z1 Z2. Um, and then in the denominator, you get RI RO Z1 plus Z2 plus Z3 plus Ri Z1 Z2 plus Z3, it's a little bit of a long expression, Ro times Z2 times Z1 plus Z3 plus Z1 Z2 Z3. So it's kind of a long expression in the denominator, okay? Fine, that's what we needed to do here. Um, now, what do we learn from this? What we learn is that, okay, we wanted to see this thing. We said, okay, let's, let's try to apply that condition that we generally know is not necessarily sufficient, but from a small perspective, let's look at that condition. If we want to basically our T to be negative one. If our T is negative one, it means what? So think about this. If these are purely reactive, all the Zs, Z1, Z2, and Z3 are purely reactive. Right? It means that they are purely imaginary as an impedance. Right? So let's look at the denominator. What is real and what is imaginary in the denominator? If they are purely reactive. Right. These two are real. And these two are imaginary combined, right? So what, that, what does that tell us? And, and the numerator also is going to be real, right? Because it's two, either j something or 1 over j something multiplied by each other. And in either case, you get something real. So, so this is real. Well, more accurately, this is real, right? Now, if, if these, this, that's the case, now, we want it to be a real, and you want it to be either, basically, it's magnitude to be greater, the magnitude of the real to be greater than one, and you want its imaginary part to be zero. So setting the imaginary part to zero gives you a condition, right? Setting the imaginary part to zero, what does it tell you? It says, Ri, Ro, Z1 plus Z2 plus Z3, plus Z1, Z2, Z3 has to be zero. Right? That's what it tells you. And now, one of the interesting things is that the imaginary part is what will give you the frequency of oscillation. So this condition will actually give, give you the frequency of oscillation. I'll show you an example of that in a second. Now, and sometimes, actually, so, so what happens is that a lot of times, Z1, Z2, Z3 is quite small. And therefore, the, condition of os the oscillation condition is simply given by 
or, or the frequency of oscillation is given by this. So this is an approximation that's a lot of times is used. So this, the frequency at which the sum of these three impedances becomes zero roughly gives you the frequency of oscillation. If you want to know it exactly, you just basically solve this. Now, and I, again, as I said, I will show you an example of it in a second. How about the real part? What does the real part tell you? Does the real part tell you something useful too? Well, we know we want, so if the, now this, if this has been set to zero at the frequency of oscillation, right? At the frequency of oscillation, this is going to be zero. So what is left is this other part, right? The real part. So if you write the real part, basically what you want is that you want negative gm ri ro, so this is the real part, z1, z2, divided by ri z1 squared plus r2 z2 squared, and if you simplify it. Uh, and if you have those, that, con those, that condition, you're basically applying these conditions in there. You will get to this condition. Is smaller than or uh, equal negative 1. And then that translates to GMRO greater than or equal Z1 over Z2 plus RO over RI Z2 over Z1. So what it tells you is that this tells you that you need to have at least this much gain, a GMRO, here for you. Now, you generally need a little bit more than one. You need that, you need that to be greater than, and usually by factors of two, because you, if you have the proper setting, if you're not in one of these conditionally stable settings, you want it to have sufficient margin for what we call a startup for the oscillator. When there's a little bit of noise, there should be sufficient gain for it to amplify it for the oscillator to reach the steady state. So that's an, that's the, that gives you the startup condition or the amplitude condition. Now, let's look at an example for the, for the frequency part just to make sure that we see how it actually works. So yeah, I can't fit it here, really. So the example we are picking is essentially the Colpitz oscillator, the simple I mean, it can be bipolar, it can be MOSFET, doesn't matter. So let's say you have a current source here. Um, yeah. And then you have an inductor. And then there's an RL. And uh, that's it. So let's call this L. C1 and C2, I think that's the way I named them. Or C, C2 and, uh, yeah. C2, C2. Yeah, yes, C2 and C, C1 and C2, yes, that's good. Uh, okay, and then the base is biased at some point, we bias. So if you look at these, what are the impedances? What are the Z1, Z2, and Z3? Right? What is Z1? Well, Z1, what, which impedance is Z1? Z1 is the impedance connected between the collector and ground, right? AC ground. What is that? The inductor, right? So it's going to be L, J, L, omega. And Z2, in that case, is going to be uh, C2, I believe, uh, or 1 over Cs, or 1 over, so you can write it as Ls2, but you can write it as 1 over C1, uh, Z2 is between the output, uh, it, it's, it's between the input and the base. Okay, so, so that's basically C2s, 1 over J omega C2. And then Z3 would be 1 over C1s. 1 over j omega c1. Now, that's basically what you have. And if you plug this, for example, let, let's look at that approximation. z1 plus z2 plus z3 equals 0. z3 equals 0. So let's add them, right? So we get ls plus 1 over c1s plus 1 over c2s equals 0. 
So what do I have? What do we have? We get the, so you can write it as j omegas and all those things, and you can factor this thing out. So this becomes 1 over s, 1 over, one over so it becomes ls plus 1 over c equivalent s, 0, where c equivalent is c1, c2 over c1 plus c2. And from this, you can easily see if you plug in j omega, what you see is that you will see that L omega uh, equals 1 over C omega. And from that, you get the omega of oscillation being 1 over square root of LC equivalent. So the oscillation frequency from this approximately is the series combination of these two capacitors in parallel with the L. That's what determines. So the tank really is formed at the output, and you get what you expect from that. Now, if you want to make it more accurate, you can actually use that exact equation, which involves Ri and Ro. And when you do that, you get a slightly different expression. So if you do that, if you do that full equation, basically write Ri, Ro times Z1 plus Z2 plus Z3 plus z1, z2, z3 equals 0. If you take that into account and plug it in, you get an omega oscillation, which would be a more accurate estimate, which would be given by 1 over LC equivalent plus 1 over Ri, Ro, C1, C2. And you can calculate the amplitude that way. So, so that, the, the, the frequency that way. So that's fine. So you can calculate the frequency. Now, a lot, depend, a lot of different oscillator topologies, there are lots of oscillator topologies with different names, are essentially that, to, that top topology, this topology, with different kind of impedances in different places. So if you, for example, put an inductor here and two capacitors here, you will get something. You will get Hartley. And then if you put these capacitors here and two inductors there, you will get Armstrong and things of that sort. And depending on where you put them, you will get the different ones. Yes? So in the diagram, you drew everything like the, the reactive physical kind of went back to the gate. Right. And then in, in my diagram, so that's right. So in this diagram, it's re reference to the gate, to the, to the base or gate. And in this picture, it's coming to this emitter. So one way to think about that is that it's this voltage that's the controlling voltage, right? So applying it here versus there, other than the impedances, has the same effect with the, positive, with the opposite sign, right? So moving this up and down from a small signal perspective is the same as moving this up and down with the small signal from the small signal perspective with the opposite polarity. The impedance seen looking into here and impedance looking here are different, which we need to take into account. But from, and that's why the, 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 the in initial calculation of the gain of a common, emit, common emitter and common base, or common gain and common source, the common, common uh, source and common gate are the same with a change in polarity. Because it's the same signal fluctuating, but in different polarity. You're applying it to this input or that input. The impedances are different that you see in looking into those things. Right? Any other questions? OK, good. So, so that's for the amplitude. Now, the question is what? So, so the, the, the frequency, sorry, not the amplitude, the frequency. How about the amplitude? Can we calculate the amplitude of an oscillator? How do we calculate the amplitude of an oscillator? Or estimate what the amplitude of an oscillator would be? How would it behave with parameter variations and things of that sort? So that's something that we alluded to a while back when we were talking about general properties of oscillators and things of that sort. But we didn't really dive deep into it. And we will not dive deeply into it either today. There's a lot that can be said about that. But we'll do a little bit. So the situation with an oscillator is really that, so think about it. We have, how, what determines the amplitude, steady state amplitude of an oscillator? Think about it. Let's say, so you're making a system that's intentionally unstable, right? Its amplitude, if you start from a very small per level, you, it, it will just grow exponentially, right? But at some point, for it to have a steady state amplitude, it needs to, sad, it needs to become flat. It needs to flatten, right? And that process is determined by what? What makes it become flat what, or, or stable, not grow forever exponentially? There has to be some nonlinearity, right? Some nonlinear mechanism needs to kick in. So how do we model that? We've thought, talked about this picture before when we were talking about nonlinear stability, 
Um, and it's basically a picture along these lines. So you have some gate, that, some dump block that has gate, but now in general can be nonlinear. And then you have some linear block with some frequency dependence. And then you take this signal and add it in phase. So now in general, this is something that has an input. Now in overall, you can actually get rid of this input and have a self-sustaining system if it's a self-oscillatory system or apply no input and it will provide the output for you. So how do we model something like this? How do we think about this? Now in general, this G is G of V of the voltage. So let's say this is the V. Now it has some nonlinear properties, right? So if the input output properties of it may have some nonlinear shape. So we can, there are lots of different things, the nonlinear forms that um, you can have. You know, they say, um, you know, uh, one of the famous mathematicians actually said, uh, there is only one kind of system, what, there's one kind of nonlinearity. Systems that are linear are one type. There are many, many different nonlinearities. So talking about a nonlinear theory of something, it's akin to say, it's talking about a non-elephant theory model of animals. Right? So linear systems are a very specific, very special case. There are many, many, either, you can think about them as a measure zero subset of all of the possible systems that you can have, right? There are many, many a lot more different kinds of nonlinearities, right? Um, I think was it Chekhov who said something along the similar lines. He said, uh, uh, all functioning families are the same. Uh, all dysfunction, dysfunctional families are dysfunctional in different ways, right? So, so that's, that's kind of like thing. Uh, anyway, so you have a nonlinearity. In general, it's kind of like difficult to think about it. But let's say you have some sort of general V in, V out characteristic that you can define. Now, the question is that if this V in, V out is coming through some sort of a resonator, so let's say this is some sort of a resonance behavior, this will have a highly filtering characteristic, right? So if you tune it, for example, to be resonant at the, around the frequency of oscillation, yes, what comes out, so for example, what what comes out of this GI in a periodic system may look like that, right? But if you feed this through some sort of a resonant filter, what would you get? What you will end up getting is some sort of a sine, well, it's not the right frequency for that sine wave, but you will get some sort of a sine wave, right? So, so we'll have, who's, fun, who's basically at the frequency of the fundamentals. So this basically will have to happen like this. At the output, so here, right? So even if you put something periodic that's a non-sinusoidal, it would produce something more or less sinusoidal if it goes through a narrow enough filter, a high quality f filter, right? So this is, you can think about a special case where this is basically a resonator around omega naught. If that's the case, then what would define V in? So this would be V1. So you can imagine a scenario that you drive a nonlinear device with a sinusoid and look at the harmonic content of what comes out of it. Right? That would be one way to characterize this. And these are called, the, and, and this is basically a describing function analysis. To give you an example, imagine that you have a, let's say, a bipolar or MOSFET, doesn't matter. I mean, in this case, it really doesn't matter. And let's say it's biased at some fixed I bias. And then you put some sort of a capacitor here, a large capacitor, to bypass the source to, or, the, or the emitter to ground. And you drive the input with some V1 cosine of omega naught t or omega 1 t, whatever. And then you look at the current that comes out the output, right? This is going to be some sort of an I of t, I out of t. What, do I, what can we say about I out of t if the input is driven with a cosine, with a fixed sinusoidal, with, a, with, with an amplitude of V1? So what can we say about that? There's, there's one property it has, right? What comes out? If you have a memory-less nonlinearity like this, or even if it's memory, but just, like, just something like this. If I drive it with that, it's going to be also periodic, right? With a period of omega naught. So you can write it as a Fourier series, right? You can say write it as n equals 1, 2, I mean, there may be dc part of it, 2, 2, but it doesn't matter. Um, so you can write it as i0 plus n equals 1 to infinity of i n cosine of n omega naught t. 
So you can write as a Fourier series in general. Now, what term in this Fourier series matters the most in this picture? So there's a DC, there's a fundamental, there's a second harmonic. What is the term that actually makes it through this system, through this filter? Fundamental, fundamental right? So although here you have all sorts of things, so if you look at waveform here, it's kind of very non non-sinusoidal, what comes out is going to be more or less sinusoidal. And it's the fundamental component of that description that would tell you how much of the signal you will get here, right? So if you think about that, um, does it make sense to define in, in aggregate for this system, for, for this guy, if I define a capital GN, large signal transconductance, and if I define it as a ratio of I1 to V1, this is really GM1, because you can imagine that you can define this for harmonic terms too, and could be useful for other things. But for now, let's call it just GM, the capital GM, would be defined as a ratio of I1 to V1. Right? So this is what we call the large signal transfer, uh, the large signal transconductance, or the, describing, the fundamental term of the describing function in the describing function analysis. So this is the describing function. So let's find out what that would be. Now, in general, what that relationship is depends on the nature of the nonlinearity. Right? In general, if you change the shape of nonlinearity, if you have a different equation, you will get different things. For example, if you have exponentials, like you have in a bipolar case, the case of a bipolar transistor, you can do this analytically. And there are places where you can look it up. For example, Clark and Hess is an old book that has the analysis for this. And it will be expressed in terms of modified Bessel functions. You can actually express them in terms of modified Bessel functions, I1, I2, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But that's unnecessary for the following, I mean, that may be unnecessary for the following reason. So let's look at two special, two limiting cases of this. One is when V1 is much smaller than, let's say, Vt, the thermal voltage, Kt over Q, or voltage. It's very small. If V1 is very small, what, can you, what would you say? What would you see? What is the Gm of V1? And by the way, Gm, as you can see, is also a function of V1. So for this condition, what is Gm of V1? It's the ratio of the fundamental of what comes out to what goes in, right? But if you're very, very small, it is basically the Gm of the transistor, right? You're in a small signal model. You're in the small signal regime, really, right? And you can use the small signal model. So this becomes essentially Gm, lowercase gm, of the transistor when that's very small which is basically going to be I tail for a bipolar transistor divided by Vt, the thermal voltage, Kt over Q, 25 millivolts, et cetera, et cetera. Now, so that's fine. What if we are in the other end of the spectrum? Now, v, V1 is much greater than Vt. It's highly nonlinear. What would you get? Well, think about it. There's one condition on this thing. This, what is the, to, if this is I of T, right, I out of T, we have fixed the total current to be I bias, right? So what does that mean? It means that the average of this thing has to be I bias. So if you take this and average it over a period or something like that, it should give you I bias. Because you can't get to, no net total current more than that, right? I mean, times an alpha, but alpha doesn't matter. Really. Let's say alpha is one. But OK, so we know that. So as you make it more, drive it harder and harder, the total current cannot ex ex increase. So what would you expect it to become? It becomes sharper and sharper, right? If you, if you drive it harder, then these things become sharper and sharper. Because this voltage, DC voltage, adjusts itself so that, the voltage drives this capacitor, so that the transistor is only turned on only at the tip of this thing. And this is large enough, and it will just inject that amount of current. So they become closer and closer to an impulse train, if you will. In the limit, it becomes an impulse train. But anyway, so if you have this, and if, you, if I ask you, what is the fundamental component of this? What would you say? What is the fundamental component uh, of this sharp, these sharp pulses, the I1 of them? Well, if you don't know, you can calculate it, right? What is I1, that coefficient? It's 2 over t, this is Fourier series, right? 
zero from integral from zero to t of i of t cosine of omega zero t or n uh, this case yeah n would be one so omega zero t dt. No, oh, there's no t really, so it's going to be t. Okay. So that's that's that integral. But now, if these are very sharp, it means that it's only the value of these guys where that matters. At the peak of the cosine, right? And the peak of cosine is what? So where this value is non-zero, this guy is almost 1. So I can approximate this as 1, and then say this is approximately 2 over t, integral from 0 to t, of i of t dt. Right? But what is this quantity? Do you know what this quantity is? It's i bias. Right? That's the average. So you get 2 over t i bias times t. So this cancels. So you get 2 i bias. So this quantity is really i bias times t. Right? Um, this quantity, well, what I should have said is that what is this quantity, and then that becomes i bias. And it's 2 i bias. So I want the fundamental component of this like sharp, this just like lobes of current, is essentially 2 i bias. So if you know that, then calculating gm is pretty straightforward. So gm of v1, which is by definition i1 over v1, is going to be 2 i bias over v1. So what does this tell you? It tells you, so now from this, you can actually draw a, let's plot gm of v1 versus v1. We know the two ends of it. We know for very small quantities, this is going to be gm. Lowercase gm equals i bias over vt. Right? So this is what it is for small quantities, for small drive. And we know for large drive, it's basically a 1 over, uh, it's, this is basically I, 2 i bias over v1. Now, when you actually do the full analysis, if you actually do the full analysis with the Bessel functions and things of that sort, you will see something that looks like that. But what does it tell you? It, it tells you that this GM, this capital GM, is monotonically decreasing as the amplitude is increasing. Which kind of makes sense, right? Because it says that when the oscillation starts in the beginning of the cycle, when, the, when you have small fluctuations, you have the large GM. You have the lowercase GM, which is the largest it can be. As the amplitude increases, the gain starts reducing going down and down, and there would be a point at which you reach a steady state, so you reach a gain, that if you go above that, you will have, don't have sufficient gain, so the amplitude drops. And if you go below that, you, you have a little bit extra gain, so the amplitude is maintained. So you get a steady state amplitude in the response. So you have this kind of behavior. So for larger values, things that are much larger than kT, kT over Q, 25 millivolts, you can actually use this approximation, right? So this is basically an approximation, really for V1 much greater than Vt. But in the case of a bipolar, for example, this is 25 millivolts. So it's easy to be significantly larger than 25 millivolts. So this may be a good approximation. Now, actually, even if the amplitude is large, you can see that this is actually independent of the nature of the device. Because we didn't make any assumption about this being an ex caused by an exponential. right? So this is true for any device, as long as you drive it hard enough. So that's why this expression is quite useful. This is actually a very useful expression for any kind of device, as long as it's driven hard enough. That's what the capital GM looks like. So at the end of this tail, that tail of this curve is the same for all devices. Here, this part of it and the transition part may be different, depending on the physics of the transistor and the model and all those things. Okay? So that's one thing to keep in mind. So how can we use this? Can we use this to calculate the amplitude of an oscillator, for example, right? So let's try. Let's, let's see what we can do. So let's imagine a variation of Colpitz, which is sometimes called also clap oscillator. 
um, which looks like this. So let's say you have a device. You have a capacitive divider here on this end, an inductor. So this is like a, and then um, a resistance, let's call it G GL, a conductance GL. I think I could call this thing C2 and C1. So this is C2 and C1. This is connected to VDD. And this is some I bias. And let's see if we can calculate the amplitude of this thing for large amplitudes. OK. So what do we know? We know, so how can we model this thing? We can actually think about this this way. The current is being injected here, right, by the transistor. So you can also think about an equivalent model, so that the, the drain current, which is the same thing as source current, is injected there. So we can actually think about drawing an equivalent for this circuit, which looks like this. So you have the GL, you have L, you have the C2 and C1, and then you have a current source that's being injected here, which is GM V1, where V1 is this voltage. The GM of V1. I'm sorry, V1 is not that voltage. V1 is actually this voltage, the gate drive here. So, so this is V1. Because that's what drives the transistor, but that's what the control voltage of the transistor actually is, right? OK. so. What is the relationship between V1 and V tank? Let's call this V tank. The full swing here is V tank. So what is the relationship between V1 and V tank in general, in the absence of this drive? Well, it's a capacitive divider, right? It's a voltage divider here. So that's a relatively simple one. So we know V1 is V tank times, now since capacitors' impedances are 1 over their C, so it becomes C1 over C1 plus C2. And we define this as N. So we define N as C1 over C1 plus C2. So you can write as NV tank. Uh, yeah, NV tank. OK, so now let's think about this. If that's NV tank, what is GM? So if I take this, and if I want to say, OK, Instead of this current source here, if I wanted to replace it with a current source that goes directly across the tank, I've left myself no room here at all. So let's say I wanted to replace that current source with an equivalent current source that injects something here across the entire tank, not into part of it. How should that current source be with respect to this? Would I, what fraction of the current injected here ends up going into the tank? It's roughly this divider, right? There's a current divider between these two, approximately. So that ratio is determined by the ratio of this impedance divided by the sum of the two impedances, which is basically going to be 1 minus n, the way we defined n and erased it, uh, n c1 over c1 plus c2. Uh, so it would be c2 over c1 plus c2 times the current that drives it, gm v1. Okay. So that's the current, the equivalent current that you can put there to drive that guy. Now, and what is this GM of V tank? So this is basically the voltage is going to be GM times V1. That would be the current. Now, what is GM though, if you think about it? We have to think about that nonlinear transfer constant that we have. Now, let's do one more thing. Let's write this in terms of V tank instead of V1. We have this relationship between V1 and V tank. So we can write this as N times 1 minus n gm v tank using this relationship. Just plugging that in to the second expression, right? Good? <coughs> so if you do that, what do we get? Well, so that's the current that's being injected into this tank, into this parallel RLC. So now instead of this guy, I have that guy. I replace that with an equivalent current injected there. Now, what is the voltage that this current induces? I'm inject we are injecting a known current into a parallel RLC tank. right? What is the voltage? It's that current times the impedance, right? So we know that V tank is this current uh, 
n times 1 minus n gm v tank times the impedance here, which would be what? Well, or you can write it as the other way around. So actually, let me write this. This current is, and this current, I injection, is 1 n times 1 minus n gm v tank times v tank times the reactance y tank of the tank of this thing inside the circle. I'm just writing it the other way. Which basically is v tank times what? What's the reactance? It is gl plus uh, j omega c equivalent, which is the series combination of those two, plus 1 over j omega l. OK? Now, which basically, now if you look at these two, you can see that the V can tank actually cancels from both sides. Except for one thing. This GM is also a function of V tank. So this is really, if you want to write it, because GM, that's a large signal time. So it's V tank, GM of V tank times V tank. So these V tanks cancel, and you're left with this ex these two expressions. So what do you have? You have a real part and an imaginary part, right? Let's look at the imaginary part. If these two, the left-hand side is real, right, in our calculations. So if you want this to be equal, the imaginary part of the right-hand side has to be zero, which basically means that this, this sum needs to be zero. That's the imaginary part. And if you plug that in, you will basically see that omega is 1 over square root of L C equivalent, where C equivalent is C1, C2 over C1 plus C2, sometimes shown as C1 parallel C2 which basically this is like half of the geometric mean, half of the harmonic mean, not the parallel combination. It's really a series combination for the capacitor. It's this mean thing. So that's what we got before too, right? So the, the, the frequency of oscillation is determined by this L and the series combination of these capacitors from this calculation. Now what does the real part tell us? So if you equate the real parts, what do you get? So you have N, 1 minus N, gm of v tank equals gl, right? So that's what you get. So what do we learn from that? Well, what do we know? What else do we know? Well, we have done this thing, right? We know that gm of v has that functionality. So we can plug it in. We can say n. 1 minus n. Now, this is actually, sorry, this is not the GM of V tank. This is GM of V1. Because V1 is the one that determines it, not V tank. Sorry, I, I, I made a mistake there in the way I wrote it. Right? So if you write that GM of V1, we know that it's going to be 2i bias divided by V1 equals GL. And V1 and V tank are related through this relationship. So you can actually write it as n, 1 minus n, 2i bias over uh, n v tank equals gl. And this n cancels that n. And what you're left with is that v tank is going to be 1 minus n, 2i bias over gl, which you can also write as 2i bias rl, parallel resistance of the tank, times 1 minus n. So this is the key result. This basically an expression, is an expression for the amplitude of the oscillation. So when you do this, the imaginary part gives you the frequency, and the real part, through the describing function, through the large signal GM, gives you the amplitude. Now, what properties do you see in this amplitude? It means that, for example, if you use a higher quality tank, if the quality factor of your tank is higher, meaning that G, the, Transconductance is smaller, or the conductance, not transconductance, the conductance of the tank is smaller, or if the parallel resistance is larger, you're closer to an ideal LC, right? If you're closer to an ideal LC, what happens is that you will see that essentially you are getting, you get more bang for your buck. You translate a smaller bias current to the larger amplitude. Similarly, you can see that you can increase the tank amplitude linearly in this region with a bias current. 
The more current that you have, the, the larger your steady state oscillation amplitude will be. And of course, there's this correction factor, 1 minus n, so which is basically C. This is C2 over C1 over C2. And in a properly designed oscillator, this is close to 1. I mean, it's like maybe 0.8 or something like that. Um, not that close. But, but if you look at this, if you plot the steady state tank amplitude versus I bias, the bias of the oscillator. So what you see, this, what does this expression tell you is that, OK, there's a linear increase of the steady state, of the steady state oscillation amplitude with that. Now, there are two caveats to this. One is that at some point, this relationship also breaks, right? Why would it break if you, if you keep increasing the current? Hit, you hit the rail voltage, right? Because your transistor starts not being in the, you know, for a bipolar transistor in the, you know, uh, in the forward active region or for a MOSFET in the, in the pinch-off region, and all, all of these assumptions will break down. So this region of operation is called the current limited. Limited operation. Now at some point, you hit the voltage limited because you hit a volt supply rail, right? You hit a rail or you hit the supply line or something like that. The transistor kind of leaves that operation point. So that basically. Now, the other question I have for you is that do you expect this to go all the way to zero? Straight line? Why not? Because remember, as you're reducing the amplitude, at some point this basically just becomes GM. And your GM is proportional to I itself. So at zero or at epsilon, your GM is also infinitesimal. So if you go around your loop the way we did the ca initial calculation of the loop gain evaluation, you do not even have a loop gain that maybe whose magnitude is greater than one. At some point, the magnitude drops below one. And if you have a magnitude below one, we know that under normal circumstances, and again, this is not always true. We saw counterexamples of this. But if it drops sufficiently below one, you don't expect it to be a steady state oscillation. So at some point, there's a startup. So the actual curve looks like that. So you need a certain minimum. So this is like I min or I startup. That you need to have for the oscillator to even start oscillating. And immediately it jumps to that minimum, that, to that level. It doesn't start from zero because you don't have loop gain there. And then you basically keep growing and then it becomes flat. So this is a general behavior that you see in, a, in an oscillator. You see this current limited regime, you see a voltage limited regime, and you see a startup limited. <coughs> okay. Any questions on that? <coughs>